Prestige heads and welcome to American Prestige. I'm Danny Best there here without my co-host and comrade Derek. Derek has just been putting in for time off for months and months and months. I couldn't deny him any longer, so he is out of the office this week. But I am even happier. Don't even take that too personally, Derek, because my two friends are here to join me to talk about U.S. foreign policy and many other things. The first is Mike Brennis. Mike, you know him, you love him, is co-director of the Brady Johnson Program in Grand Strategy and lecturer in history at Yale University. And Stephen Wertheim is also here. First host, first first guest, not first host, I'm the first host, first guest on the program ever. And Stephen, of course, is a senior fellow in the American Statecraft Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. So thank you for joining us, guys. Thank you for joining me, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. It's good to be, good to be back with you, aside, as always, from the <laughs> fact that I'm not for receiving any benefit from doing this. If you're, you're receiving PR. This is, this is prestige. I, I learned from academia. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, the prestige of becoming on this podcast. Um, I can't eat prestige. Becoming yeah. on this podcast. <laughs> you could eat American prestige. But Stephen, I, I want to talk about this new book, obviously, that Mike and I recently published and that you are in. Uh, it's an edited volume from Paul Grave talk, uh, called Rethinking U.S. World Power, Domestic Histories of U.S. Foreign Relations. But Stephen, you're presently making a domestic history of U.S. foreign relations. So b- before we get in the book, and I do want to talk about your piece and I do want to talk about the book, what is the tenor in D.C. these days in the foreign policy community? Because in the past, my sense is that things actually slowed down a little bit before presidential elections, just because foreign policy usually isn't a focus in presidential elections. But it looks like this time it might actually be primarily related to um, Israel's assault on Gaza, but also perhaps in Ukraine. So what are what are the, the, the pointy headed intellectuals in D.C. talking about these days when it comes to foreign policy and how does it relate to the election? I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. It's a curious situation. I think you're right that foreign policy is looking to be pretty salient in this election. Um, And of course, there's the ongoing crises in Ukraine, in Gaza. Um, Weirdly enough, like China seems to be now on the back burner. So, you know, maybe that's the one area where things are not actively getting more horrible by the day. Um, but despite the kind of importance of foreign policy politically now and seemingly the big decisions that ought to be made, um, I'd say that the foreign policy debate, uh, is stuck. There's not much happening by way of like making a deal over Ukraine aid. Um, I've been pretty surprised that the administration hasn't wanted to do what often happens in politics where you have two parties on different sides and you try to meet in the middle. So there doesn't really seem to be a deal on the table. Um, at least the ones that have been tried have fallen apart, but it didn't really affect, um, you know, the, the Ukraine strategy that, um, the white house has put forward. And, you know, with Gaza, it's this daily sort of show of the U.S. being irritated with the Israelis, the Israelis being irritated with the Americans. And, you know, what I'm looking for is, is the United States going to actually pull material support or threaten to do so or not? And the answer has been no uh, since October 7th. And until we get to that point, I'm not sure what is really changing about U.S. policy. So I just have a quick question, because as as you know, Joe Biden is the most left-wing president of my lifetime, Stephen. He is a, a left-wing hero, a left-wing stalwart. How has Joe Biden's presence, or how has it not, opened up space for more heterodox thinking in the left-wing foreign policy world? Or just say in the foreign policy world, not the left wing world. Has there been any actual shift in this amongst younger people or or is it reproducing itself in a kind of ideologically coherent, 
American century is still here. Way I, I, now that you're in the side the belly of the beast, I'm just curious. I think that the Biden administration came in to office understanding that there was a big legitimacy deficit among the people in terms of America's traditional foreign policy. Um, and they wanted to make some changes. And I think they're pretty successful, actually, in, you might say, co-opting, um, you know, reformist uh, sentiments among young people, among progressives. They obviously have made changes in economic policy, political economy, with a turn to industrial policy. They also, you know, came in uh, and withdrew from Afghanistan, denounced forever war. And there was some consideration, I think, in the government of going farther than that and changing the U.S. global force posture. Right-sizing would be the terminology, right-sizing. Uh, which is sometimes code for downsizing. Um, but it turned out at the end of the first year, you know, the DOD decided, hey, we've basically been doing everything right. Um, and then uh, since then, I think what you've seen is um, in U.S. security and military policy, a return to or orthodoxy with the war in Ukraine, a lot of excitement that the U.S. was now the good guy again in the world. And there was a real purpose for American global power. Um, and that's proven to be pretty short-lived. And now I think we are on the cusp of more space opening up. I think the Biden administration has largely given up on its attempt to, to look like it was something other than restorationist when it comes to security policy, right? Economic policy, different story. Um, you know, I'm thinking of the president's address uh, after October 7th of last year, where he, you know, pulled out the old chestnut of America as the indispensable nation. And now he seems to be just sort of locked into, you know, what we're doing is right. Um, critics of Ukraine aid are pro-Putin or playing into Putin's hands. And, you know, it seems to be a pretty naked appeal to, you know, a traditional pre-Trump foreign policy with this oddity that Donald Trump is actually running for president, polling now a little bit ahead of Biden and so could well be the next president of the United States. So I think the conditions are there. I haven't even really gotten to the Gaza war, right? Where I think so many people, you know, our age and younger, Danny, are from the very beginning, actually, have looked at this and said, I don't follow what's going on. This makes no sense. Like, I, I understood why we would support Ukraine. They're the victims in the war. But this policy makes no sense. And it's so nakedly one-sided. So I think the discontent is there. But, you know, if we just assume that Biden is reelected, um, I'm not sure what it's going to amount to. There's a lot less discussion today, I think, of a kind of comprehensive progressive foreign policy alternative. That's partly because the Democratic Party is not like the Republican Party. Democrats like their party. Uh, they hate the other party more than they hate, you know, other parts of their party. And one of the risks, I think, of the backlash to um, the unconditional U.S. support for Israel is that people tend to care about that issue quite a bit but not connect it elsewhere uh, to U.S. foreign policy, even in the Middle East, uh, let alone beyond that. So I, right now, I think it's pretty clear there's a progressive backlash and a generational backlash on the Israel-Palestine issue. Uh, but whether that expands into something or not is hard to say. All right. So, Stephen, what are the obstacles that you would say? Is it literally just gerontocracy, that these are people who are steeped in the Cold War and the unipolar era, and once they retire or die, there will actually be a generational shift? Is it lobbying groups? Just what do you see as the obstacles to a transformation in the grand strategy, frame it broadly, of privacy um, in U.S. foreign relations? Yeah, I think it'd be too simple to say that, you know, when the current ruling generation passes from a scene, then all will be well. First of all, there's a huge amount of path dependency now because the U.S. set out 
uh, on the quest for primacy a long time ago, and now we're we're in a number of jams. And so the it becomes more and more difficult the more the United States has entered into truly adversarial relations with uh, countries, then you have a real threat in a sense uh, with those enemies. And primacy also has discouraged uh, American allies and partners from taking responsibility themselves to manage security problems. So in a sense, the, the difficulties keep mounting. It would have been a lot easier for the U.S. to pull back in the 1990s. Um, but you know, now I think it, it, it requires taking on some pretty clear risks for the United States to do that. Now, maybe in the Middle East, you know, you could say the U S record has been so bad that even if the United States left a vacuum and there was short term destabilization, you could make the argument that, look, uh, things were not better with us there. Uh, I think the American people would be fine with that. Um, with Europe, it's it's a little bit different, um, but you know the military-industrial complex, so-called, that's very influential, right? Um, that's a problem. Uh, there are foreign government lobbies that uh, would also stand in the way of action. So, and the U.S. is it's a you, you have to have bureaucracy make changes, um, and so a president that maybe thinks, hey, maybe we should get out of the Middle East. Is that so bad? They have to have the personnel around them that actually really want to do that. And then they have to uh, be able to appoint people to the bureaucracy who are committed to that course of action. And then they have to be willing to incur political criticism when they follow through. And the fact that President Biden um, pulled out of Afghanistan and saw his poll numbers drop you know, roughly at the same time. I'm not sure exactly what the causality was. There was also another round of COVID happening at that same time, right? But the fact that, you know, it was basically a political loser to pull out of Afghanistan, which like more than 70% of the public thought was the right thing to do, um, you know, doesn't bode well. So I think this then brings us nicely to the book Mike and I published. And um, now this this is kind of for everyone. Oh, I think this is more directed towards Stephen, but then Mike will go to you. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Um, guys, Mike's just sitting there. Sorry, so, right. so I'm, I'm just, I'm just head, heading waiting, his cat. waiting to speak. I just, I just, I just put it on because of his his pretty face. Uh, but right. but Stephen, you 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 yourself were also a historian uh, once upon a time. You still are a historian. You're 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 among us. Thank you. Um, oh. right. you're, you're welcome, <laughs> Stephen. You. But so, as you know, we were all professionalized in this moment of the international and transnational turn. Um, and that really the de de-emphasizing of the domestic sources of U.S. foreign relations, etc. It's interesting, I just wanted to point out that everything that you said about the future of U.S. foreign policy was 100% shaped by domestic factors. So I'm just curious, as someone who is now doing this professionally, what do, what do you think of the international and transnational turns? What do you think of what Mike and I tried to do in this volume, which obviously you contributed to, so I presume you're on board at least somewhat. Um, and then how, do you, how does this relate to what, to what you're, you're actually doing in D.C.? And maybe actually to give Mike just a, a chance to speak. Mike, maybe you could actually describe what I mean by these international and transnational turns, and then we could go back to Stephen. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. When I was in graduate school, so I got into graduate school, I think around the same time that we all were in graduate school, so 2007, 2008, um, and then I left grad school to 2014. I was interested in foreign relations. I came into grad school thinking I was going to sort of study the role of African Americans in U.S. foreign policy, which was kind of the rage at that time, with people like historians like Mary Dijek and Tim Borselman, there are others who were doing this work. And I quickly pivoted to mostly because of Obama in 2008 and and what happened with his election in 2008, 2009 with the Tea Party. I pivoted to thinking about it'd be interesting to study the role of the right as opposed to like the left because I kind of knew that story a little bit and when I was thinking about this and sort of framing this to advisors, they're like, well, 
there's no sort of U.S. in the world component. Meaning, as you're saying, like there's there if if you wanted to study sort of uh, or wanted to more more accurately get a job uh, in in the field, it was better to look at what the field was doing at the time was sort of looking at actors outside of the U S and how the U S was kind of one nation among nations, which is a phrase that comes out of this book by Thomas Bender. who's was a, I think it was a historian at NYU. Um, and it would be better serve me professionally, <laughs> financially, uh, if I were then to sort of discard this and sort of just think about what's happening, you know, in, in, wherever, um, and then relate that back to, um, the United States in a kind of a, looking at the U S as kind of a tangential way. So what what I mean ultimately is also looking at sources that were, that were non-English sources. So there were a lot of historians who were looking, going to multi-carival sources. And this was happening for a while. I think Ernie May was right, was doing sort of the first sort of transnational history in the 1960s, but it kind of taken off, you know, in, in the midst of the, I, I would say sort of the turn to sort of, you know, globalization or like the, like the, the broader transformations of U S power and U S foreign policy in the 1990s and early two thousands, where you see kind of this shift to thinking like Thomas Friedman, the world is flat, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then the profession kind of shifting also. And so that meant domestic stories, U S centric stories were not in vogue. Um, and so I didn't really consider myself a, diplomatic historian, so to speak, professionally, um, I consider myself a political historian because then I could at least look at other, I could look at actors in the state and potentially get a job. Um, and that really, that kind of, you know, setting aside my own personal biography, I think that trajectory of sort of the U.S. in the world transnational focus has now kind of, perhaps maybe I'm wrong, but because of your article with Fred Logoval and others, that has kind of started to receive like cracks in the edifice, so to speak, where we're looking at, I think, domestic politics and, as Stephen said, in contemporary terms differently, and we're looking at the relationship between domestic politics and U.S. foreign policy in different terms. It might still be seen as anachronistic within the field, but I'm hoping or we're hoping with this volume that there's not scholars who feel emboldened to write on domestic projects who are thinking about the way the transnational tra- turn has shaped their their own study of of history, that they feel also that they can contribute to this endeavor. We're not sort of bifurcating the field between those who want to do multi archival, multi archival, uh, you know, study of non state actors outside the U.S. and then those like traditional fields of people who are looking at foreign policy making in the State Department or in Congress or the national security state, and we're bringing together those two concerns so that way students like me won't, won't feel isolated or maybe like all of us maybe you, i don't know i'm interested in like what steven and you danny also felt you know because i felt very much like i was an island to myself to a certain extent in terms of professionally i had some supporters yes but like i didn't feel like the field was going to open up and anytime soon to my interests or concerns so i'll throw that back to you then you know yeah, steven i'm, I'm curious what do you think of that because also um Mike, you were at UVA. Am I remembering that correctly? No, I went to the Grad Center at CUNY. So I was in oh, New York. Why do I think always oh, UVA? I'm sorry. You were at the Grad Center. So you were both right. in New York it's at the school. same time. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's a great school. Um, but because uh, I, I know Columbia has like, um, particularly when you were there, Stephen, I think, I think all of the academy has basically withered a little bit. Like I just hear a lot less about seminars and things like that, things that were like really going 10, 15 years ago. I think a lot of funding has been pulled. I think a lot of people, if you don't have graduate students, basically fields wither. And I think that is presently happening in history, broadly speaking. But when Stephen was there in particular, I know Columbia had a, it was very vibrant from my understanding, you know, like a group of people who became very successful in the field, yourself, Stephen, Tom Meany, Kristen Loveland, uh, even people who were there earlier, um, like um, Mira Siegelberg. Uh, and so it, it was a very exciting space. But what was your take on this when you were coming up in, in graduate school? And then I, I do want to hear about how your actual experience changed things. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I was attracted to uh, to the idea of doing international and global history at Columbia. There was a dedicated track to international and global history. Uh, I came in fall of 2008. 
And, you know, that institutionalization of international global history followed this self-conscious turn, as you mentioned, in the field starting in the 1990s. Um, and I think, you know, we should appreciate some of the good reasons and compelling reasons for the so-called international, transnational, and global turn. First of all, it was a response to the conditions around us. Uh, it was U.S. unipolar dominance, uh, non-state actors loomed large, uh, discourses of you know universal values also loomed large. So, um, you know, and the field had gone through these intense debates about, um, you know, why did the United States and the Soviet Union come to blows or cold blows uh, in the in the Cold War? And I think there was a kind of sense that that had been done and and played out and at least needed to be supplemented with more social history, cultural history, intellectual history, and above all, other kinds of actors besides Americans. And it's true that, you know, some of the critical scholarship and some of the critical politics of American power does have that tendency to implicitly or explicitly overstate the role of the United States uh, in the world. Um, it's actually pretty hard to, if you're focusing a narrative on a critique of the United States, um, it's pretty hard to like, give the impression that a lot of other actors also have agency themselves. That's just sort of part of the deal. So I think there was a response against that. I sympathize with, there's also a desire to look uh, sort of systematically at uh, international relations or even international society and understand, you know, conceptions of the international and the global um, and how they traveled historically. And so I was kind of a part of that um, that effort at Columbia when I came in, that, you know, it was a kind of boom, boomlet in Columbia of, of this, this kind of work. But I think at the same time, I came in thinking, I also do want to be dealing with the problem of American power. Uh, and over the course of uh, my seven years of the PhD, um, you know, a couple things became evident. First of all, there was no real job market in what used to be called the U.S. diplomatic history. Um, so the effect of the international, transnational, global turn kind of became to, you know, make it harder and harder to actually debate, well, why is the United States doing what it's doing in the world? Um, because if you did that, there were no jobs to even apply to, let alone get. Um, and so I, I think, Danny, I want to ask you this question, given your excellent essay um, with Fred Lobeball, you know, like how much of your criticism of the international turn is sort of like based on the project itself being deficient and how much of it was kind of like an unintended consequence of the fact that uh, the historical profession itself entered a crisis soon after the international turn came about. And therefore, you know, the sort of aspiration to maybe marry um, analysis of American global power with more attention to, you know, transnational uh, actors was subverted because, in fact, it then became basically impossible to take American power very seriously. It's, it's a really good question. And I, I just want to reiterate what you just said, which is I think the international and transnational turns were to some degree necessary, um, particularly after the, the debates in the 80s between the various schools of thought. It's kind of funny. We don't have any schools of thought in this field anymore. But between revisionists, post-revisionists, orthodox historians, bureaucratic politics model, uh, um, models, which really did emphasize the United States, quad the United States, and really did ignore particularly international actors. Um, I think the non-state actors thing is... Was all, I don't want to say taken a bit too far because I frankly don't have the data on it, like how many people were really writing on it, how many people were really published in diplomatic history. But I just think that non-state actors, while important, their their site of influence is almost always the literal state. 
So there's an interesting methodological problem there. How do you study something that's non-state when you're only really studying it in relation to the state? And to what degree is that actually analyzing non-state actors, et cetera, et cetera? Particularly in the United States, where non-state actors, I would argue, are actually part of the state, are part of the Paris state, like Stephen Carnegie, for example, right? Is that really a non-state actor? Kind of, yes. Is it a state actor? Kind of, yes. Blah blah. blah. I mean, it's you a could private say about research everything. institution. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, of course, a private research institution. So then, this the interesting question then to me about non-state actor. And then I'll just put this to the side because this is a whole other debate. Is is to what degree is this actually? Are we talking about the state? And to what 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 form does the state actually take in the 21st century if we move beyond models of 20th century mass mass politics? So that's that's another question. And the international alternatives, I think, are absolutely central, right? Like the United States lost the Vietnam War. You can't understand why that happened if you don't literally go into North Vietnamese archives, right? This is actually very crucial and, and very important. Yep. Um, but I do think a, a couple of things are important to highlight, uh, which is that um, there, there are some contingent historical circumstances, like the Cold War ended and these archives opened. That was great. So now you could literally make new careers studying new topics by going to foreign archives. But but it did, I, I think, to a certain degree, and Fred and I make this critique in the article, it's not a surprise that it was the Yales and the Harvards and the Columbias that led this charge because it requires an enormous amount of money and an enormous amount of free time to learn languages, right? So there was also, I think, almost an unconscious elitism to the project um, by, by making, you know, if you go to your um, not as elite institutions and you actually have to teach and you can't spend a year and a half in a foreign country and learning the language and becoming embedded, you're essentially cut off from the field. Um, I think that was probably unintentional, but it's just something worth recognizing there. Um, and I do think there is an irony that in the moment of the United States' is unquestioned superpowerness that you get a turn away in diplomatic historiography from actually studying the state. That, that to me is unique and questioning, uh, at least the questions probably about the ideological contours of American history and, and who's studying what, when, and where. Um, but sorry, do you have a response? Me? Me? No. Yeah, yeah, I thought, I, thought I heard a, bre- a breath. Either, either one of you, Mike, anything you want to add? Mike is responsible for breathing. I'm sorry. I said absolutely nothing. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. calm oh, and serene, an as you can tell from the tone yeah, of my voice. Okay, I'm sorry, Stephen. Mike, never do that again. You'll never be invited on this on podcast again. Um, and then, but I, 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 I so that this is my question to you, then both of you, and I'll let you take it however you want to. But why do you think it did dominate? Right. If, if if you're you know a dead alien looking at it from the sky, this is the most powerful nation on earth. It is in the 1990s and into the 2000s, but the field of study dedicated to studying this powerful nation is now kind of averting its gaze, at least slightly. Again, not to overstate the case, but overstate it for the point of argument, but recognizing that there are more nuances. Why do you think these turns were so predominant during our eras of intellectual formation? I think there are a couple of reasons. One is, you know, and it's it's kind of an irony to a certain extent, but you have the United States becoming a unipolar power, the preeminent power in the world, um, at the time this transition is happening. Um, but alongside that is, as you just said, there's the opening up of Soviet archives, and there's the transformation that's happening with the profession when you can actually start to read Soviet documents uh, and start to read even Chinese documents for a brief time too, um, like Russian documents. And, then, and I think that's, as the U S is kind of becoming this preeminent power, you know, arguably we're still in a unipolar moment, depending upon who who your perspective, what your perspective is, but there's uh, documents we can now get access to. And that's just sort of in one way, that's just one answer. It's like, we have the, we have the potential to look at things we couldn't before. And there are all sorts of articles coming out in the nineties saying like, with this opportunity, we should turn away from the state, from the U S state that is. Um, and I think that's one thing. I think the other thing, too, is that if you look at what was happening in terms of the United States and its role and how it was exercising its power, there are all sorts of arguments about, maybe no offense to Joe Nye, but soft power and what the United States could do in terms of not using military force because we don't need to have, we shouldn't perhaps, right? Right. 
or I would say we shouldn't uh, start to uh, think about invading other countries. We shouldn't have more Vietnams. We don't need to do that. Haiti in 94, perhaps, is maybe is an aberration. But overall, we, the United States can exercise its power differently. And so there was kind of a turn away from the state as sort of hard power focused military power and then looking at ways information, propaganda, media, uh, movement of peoples, um, how those things could be more influential uh, and a shift then towards cultural diplomacy and social diplomacy being um, more cultural and social history in general than cultural diplomacy being part of this, being a new way to kind of look at the way, the, like look at how international relations is shaped by the United States. And therefore, it's not really you know, a U.S. focus. It can't be a U.S. focus story. It has to be multidimensional. So, so one question, because this is um, to me very interesting, is that it's, it became, I think, by the time we entered graduate school, kind of associated with left-wing critique, but it's actually John Lewis Gaddis, who I think was the most influential figure in pushing people to, to study non-U.S. actors, right? He's really into this, um, into this project throughout the early 1990s. And I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on, on the political valence of this methodological move. Because to me, like Stephen gestured toward, like the original people who really did focus on the U.S. were Marxists, you know, revisionists in the William Appleman Williams mold. Um, so I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Stephen, it seems like you do. Yeah, so I think that there was a, a kind of a congruence uh, between the politics of a John Lewis status and a certain kind of, you know, liberal or left politics um, in the unipolar moment heyday, both of them could sort of sign on to this idea that, well, we don't need to have intensive debates about, you know, why top policymakers in the United States make the choices that they do. Um, for Gaddis, it's we know that story and like the Cold War was pretty much right. But now we need to look at, we need to look beyond the state. We need to look at other actors. So there was a left-wing version that, you know, had, sometimes it took the form of enthusiasm for humanitarianism and human rights uh, in the globalization, unipolar moment before 9-11. Then there was a strain of scholarship that became critical of that, um, so I, I, you know, just sort of pulling back from there, I think that we've gone through um, in the 1990s and the aughts a historic depoliticization in this country of foreign policy. There were plenty of foreign policy debates, president and politics, but they were, to my mind, remarkably narrow in terms of what was actually being considered, what separated the two political parties or leading figures within those parties. The debate has widened over the past decade. And it's actually, I get vertigo. I'm teaching a seminar right now. And I'm this week we're teaching like the debates over the Syrian civil war during Obama. And by the end of the Obama administration, a number of writers say, you know, the Syrian civil war is that has been the central question of U.S. foreign policy during the Obama administration. And I think that they were right as of that moment. And look how far we've come um, in less than a decade. So um, uh, so I think in a sense, the volume that you guys have done, you know, is also a reaction to the changing contours of what seems possible to debate and maybe even change about America's role in the world. American Prestige is brought to you in partnership with The Nation magazine. Please consider becoming a subscriber at AmericanPrestigePod.com forward slash subscribe. As a subscriber, you'll get access to dozens of exclusive bonus episodes, including breaking news specials, deep dives into regional histories, analysis of movies and video games, and much more. And if you subscribe at the founders level, you'll be able to claim a year digital subscription to The Nation. Thank you for listening. And now, back to the show. So I have a question. So one of the things that Fred and I were very interested, or, or at least I'll speak for myself, because Fred's not here, that got me interested in this, is that 
when I would read a lot of the international and transnational scholarship, and not all of it, I, I, it did seem to me, and again, I might be wrong, is that there was less of an interest in causality as such, as to why did the macro event that is being examined proceed as it did. Um, because it did seem to me that the, you know, the primary, <laughs> the unmoved mover, uh, to borrow from my man Aristotle, friend of the pod, was the United States. That it was, it was, even if it didn't, as Stephen gesture toward, like, direct everything. Again, it lost the Vietnam War, right? Of course, it didn't direct everything. It would have preferred not to have lost that war in however way you wanted to find losing. The entire course of that war, the way it proceeded as it did, was primarily, and that's a causal claim, might be wrong, but it's a fals falsifiable claim due to the United States. I, I was wondering if you two had any thoughts on when we were being trained in the late aughts and into the 2010s and uh, our careers as junior scholars, what, is it, what, what do you think about this question of causality and, and the field's interest in it or lack thereof? Am I, am I mischaracterizing things? Am I making it too extreme? I genuinely want to hear your thoughts. Uh, so I have, a t I have a tendency to agree with a caveat, which is that I think when you're looking at, again, sort of transnational phenomena in the ways that the field was, you and this is sort of my caveat, you don't really need to have causality and, you know, be the focus in the same way that it would be, I think, if you're looking at the example you mentioned, which is the Vietnam War. Like, if you're trying to figure out why ultimately African Americans decided to live in China, like if you're looking at like W. Du Bois or you're looking at Robert F. Williams, you're like, okay, you just want to figure out what's the exchange between sort of, you know, ideas of justice and racial justice and in a transnational sense and you're looking at people who were radicalized by mao radicalized by communism they're like what's going on you don't need this different questions you're being you're asking yourself and different questions you're asking the field and so you don't need to have the sort of one-to-one -one causal link that says okay du bois was inspired by this and then he decided to do that and then that led and then that led to sort of this larger transformative impact of in terms of the, the role of american power or the role of ideas of of racial justice you don't need to do that but i think i agree with you in the sense that what i think is happening now is that when you would push for instance like a grad student or postdoc on or you know someone who's recently left the field on causality they're like, well, I don't, I don't see, I don't see why that's important at all anymore. It's kind of that. That's what that's what I'm seeing now, at least in terms of the field. Is like, for like, well, what's the larger impact when you ask the question of sort of what's the significance of this? Then it's like, well, there's not a sort of sense of like, what what are the broader implications of what you're studying? Which to me goes to this is perhaps something we haven't discussed is sort of like the the narrowness of the fields is like what happens with the transnational turn. I think as much as again, I, I applaud the contributions it's made to to um understanding again formulations in a broader sense and i agree we can't discard those contributions there does seem to be a sense of sort of in my view like unwillingness to kind of be a lumper in foreign policy like lump lump things together and sort of understand change over time in in terms of like the cold war in terms of a post-cold war sense and there you'd have to have i think greater causal links as opposed to just understanding what's happening among these group of people in this particular time in, in a transnational framework. If that makes sense, I hope it does. But the, the sort of the idea is sort of be given up on, I don't want given up as a way of putting it, but there needs to be like a way we think about questions in broader terms, perhaps. And then you can bring back the causality link. But until that happens, the causal claims you're talking about, until that happens, I think we're kind of, we're going to be minimizing causality um among again some some types of of research you know within the field i don't know what steven you would add to that or if that's wrong or misleading i think you're right i mean i think it's inherently more difficult to drill down and do sustained causal analysis when part of the point of the scholarship you're doing is actually to complicate the nature of the actors and the spatial frame of the story you're trying to tell. And the bigger the story, the harder it is to, you know, 
understand how the causes or how potential causes relate to each other. It's really easy, in a sense, to do like causal analysis in which the principal actors are the president and top advisors, right? That's actually a really simple, relatively simple setup. Um, so I think some of it was just built in to the point of the turn itself um, that doing like, having different schools of thought with competing theories of causality was inherently going to be very hard um, under the rubric of the transnational turn. And so you see this in a book like um, Eris Manella's The Wilsonian Moment, um, a really influential book, a book uh, I couldn't possibly have the linguistic competence to do. Um, so, you know, that was a, an impressive book, but you know, basically it, it sort of frames the book around Wilson's rhetoric of, of self-determination and then looks at four cases in which there were uprisings at the end of World War One. But then um, the book actually sort of like stops short of saying, you know, Wilson's rhetoric was a cause or a key cause. And so on its face, the book uh, almost doesn't make causal claims even though clearly, yeah, I mean, Wilson's rhetoric is part of, is part of the story, but, you know, to reconstruct the, the, the causes in each of the four cases, and then to try to understand how those cases relate to an even larger global landscape, that's, you know, inherently hard to do, even with the incredible linguistic competency of, of the story in question here, Eris Manella. So, you know, I had a pretty harsh reaction against that element of the scholarship because I thought it was very strange why the United States continued to want to be the globally dominant military power even after the Cold War. And that completely shaped the question I asked in my dissertation book. Why do you think the field was so receptive? Because to me, like one of the things that historians do better than other fields is actually construct causal narratives. Like, I think it was Fred who once told me this, and it's something along, whenever the, the historian writes the word because, they're making an argumentative claim, right? So when people say, like, historians don't have method or argument, they're, 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 I, I don't think they're correct. It's just the method is literally embedded in the construction of the narrative, which is difficult for social scientists to understand because they're so concerned with design and, and test design and hypothesis questioning, but his historians actually do it within the text. So to me, it, it is like literally what makes the field different than every other field. And it, it's somewhat strange as this moment passes that historians were so not concerned with causality to the degree where the people who, um, you know, who decide on the prizes, everyone who gets the big jobs, who gets published in the major journals. It really is. If you, if you look through it, it's a lot of non-US, non-state focused stuff. And that, that might be, and also like fields of trends and fads, and maybe people are just bored because in graduate school, they had to read the orthodox versus the post-revisionist versus the revisionist. And you want to do something new, just like we're doing here, I'm sure. But it does seem to me to be an interesting sociological question almost. Curious if you guys have thoughts. I don't know. I mean, I think, I think I, I would say there's, there's a transformation to in political science that co that coincides with this, that it becomes more like, as we sort of give up, if you want to use your framing, as we give up on causality, political science starts to develop quantitative ways of proving things, even though I think that's slippery, but proving things through numbers. Um, and, and they kind of, as you're saying, they kind of take ownership of causality in ways that we haven't or didn't or abandoned. I don't know. I kind of don't know. I'm, I'm placing a value judgment on it, but I kind of don't know what to do with like changing that <laughs> like i don't know i don't know what you would do to try to inculcate the next generation if there is a next generation of of phd students in diplomatic history that can get jobs i don't know what you would do to kind of transform their thinking or whether we should should be doing that you know i think um because again sort of political science has 
we kind of ceded that to political science and they've done what they've done with it. But at the same time, we are not professionally equipped, I think, given the state of the field to kind of go back and reverse course. And I don't think there is field be receptive to that or that grad students would or should be receptive to it. So I don't know. I'm kind of in a dilemma where, you know, I don't, given the state of the field, where it's, it's in, I would argue, sort of in its death throes at the moment. Um, I would agree. What, <laughs> despite what others think, um, that this is kind of the fight we should be picking, you know. Um, but that's sort of my two cents. Stephen, I don't know if you would feel differently or... I'm yeah. just surprised that you don't want to hawk your book more. I mean, there are royalties <laughs> For the low, to be low made. price of 160 so, bucks, you could buy my and Mike's <laughs> book, We're Thinking right. U.S. World Power, Domestic Histories of my, U.S. Foreign Relations. I should auction copy off. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. I, told, I said on Twitter, I'm going to sell them and put my, put my money on a vacation home or something like that. How I, many copies did they give you? They gave me five. I think we got five. Then I, oh, yeah. my goodness. Can, but then I can get some at a 40% discount and then so I can hawk oh. those. And like, oh, you know, that's a good idea. Th th that's the game. Yeah, but you may be exceeding demand there. <laughs> well, I would start with <laughs> five. the five. Correct. <laughs> yeah, you do you do see it. what happens? Yeah, right. Yeah. Fair point. Fair point. You put that in an ETF, um, you know, in 18 years, <laughs> you've got you've got at least a maybe a, yeah. maybe like a quarter uh, of a semester of college covered. That's right. Nice. That's yeah. very good. <laughs> We've all have kids. We can, you know, start, you know, start the college fund now. And so, yeah. No, I mean, I don't know. So, but that's, that's my two cents. I don't know, Danny, was that, is that fair? Or is that not like, yeah, I'm just curious. Stephen, do you have any thoughts about that? I think you're, you're asking a great question. I, I don't really know the answer. I mean, I wouldn't want to be too, um, I wouldn't want to allow for kind of like, uh, less formal and less sustained um, ways of constructing causal narratives that historians do yeah. produce. I mean, I'm thinking of my own chapter for your volume. It's not like I weigh, well, here's the Marxist interpretation and here's a geopolitical right. interpretation. So I think there are ways of doing causality that are productive um, without having it look like the frontal kinds of debates that occurred, you know, in the Cold War historiography. Um, but I agree that there is something odd. I mean, at the end of the day, I still don't really understand how historical scholarship can be historical scholarship without making causal claims. I think it is uh, inevitably doing yeah. that. So the fact that even like, Mike, you have students that are like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> that does seem odd. So let's end with a, a final question, Stephen. Um, so now that you, you've actually been in this world and everything you described when you were talking about the state of present D.C. really was domestic. Like, is it just oh, most of the time it's hard to put a percentage, 70, 80, 90 percent of the time, just domestic, quotidian domestic political factors that actually shape U.S. foreign policy? Obviously not always. But I'm curious, like, how has how has your experience in D.C. itself shaped your historiographical thinking? Mm. I don't think you can put uh, a number on it because the international situation always matters and conditions, you know, how the U.S. might respond to it. But I guess since coming to work in D.C., I have not become, you know, less impressed with the ways in which you know, American ideology, American politics, um, American media, you know, shapes foreign policy. Um, and I don't want to read back my own personal experience onto American history because, you know, there's been a huge evolution over time. But I can more readily explain, you know, much of U.S. foreign policy in the 20th century with reference to uh, international events than I can with the U.S. adoption of primacy after the Cold War. I think that's the point where you, to me, and so this is relevant to our own time, you know, that's where to understand U.S. foreign policy in the broadest sense, I think one needs to truly study 
um, the United States itself. Uh, in part because the animating logics of American primacy are often unfalsifiable. So if things are stable in the Middle East, then Jake Sullivan will write an article saying, you know, look, our role is is now stabilizing. Things are on the move. You know, why would we screw it up by, you know, changing U.S. foreign policy significantly in the region, except to do certain things to make primacy better, um, like promote normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And then, you know, after October 7th, then he has to make edits to the online version of the same article. But now the administration is again pursuing the normalization <laughs> agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And this time, somehow they think they're going to throw in some kind of Israeli commitment to to create a two-state solution. So, you know, I think in the era that means the most for understanding U.S. foreign policy today, which is the post-Cold War era, um, it's been heavily a heads-I-win, tails-you-lose logic, right? NATO expanded because, well, there wasn't really a threat. And now there is more of a threat with Russia. And so good thing we expand in NATO. This is just as George Kennan predicted, uh, things would unfold um, when the NATO enlargement, the post-Cold War NATO enlargement process began in the late 1990s. So there is no answer in principle that Washington has to under what conditions could the United States say, hey, mission accomplished. Um, and now the U.S. can reduce uh, its preeminent security role in one of the regions that really matter. So just on those grounds alone, you know, and especially in terms of like claim making and foreign policy, um, you know, that seems like a, a central issue to grapple with. Now, I do think, though, in some of the factors that we discussed earlier, um, some of those are international factors. The degree of um, rivalry now between the United States and, and China and Russia Um you know, I think that that does very much change the the situation, both for primacists um, and for people on the restraint side. Um, and both camps, I think, are trying to adjust because they developed their arguments in the unipolar moment. Um, and now they have to decide, you know, to what extent is you know, deep rivalry between the United States and China and between the United States and Russia, is that something to now just accept that there's no easy way out of that, um, number one, or is there still some kind of off-ramp? Um, and then number two, uh, what do we do about it? Well, that's a very good place to end. Stephen Wartime, Mike Brennis, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to having you back again soon.